Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of the Robbie Basil Show. Uh, this is take two. We have tried to film this video before. We tried to film it last night. And uh, rather predictably, uh, the Wi-Fi went out again. So we are. I'm in a different spot in my house. Hopefully the Wi-Fi doesn't go to crap. But that's not what we're focused on. We're not focusing on Wi-Fi today. We have sports to talk about. You know, the Euros have been great. The Copa America group stage ended last night. We had Brazil almost get grouped. I'll talk about that later. We had a crazy race over the weekend in Formula 1. Wimbledon's been nuts. But today we are talking about none of those things. In the beginning, at least. Because I have two guests with me. One returner in Cam, who is hopefully waving at the screen. And Luke, who is here as well. They're going to help me break down NHL free agency. So... It's gonna be chaos. It's well, we talked about how we'll talk about later how much money he's been given out so far. I mean, it's over a billion dollars, which is outrageous. But Luke, your blue shirts have been. It's an interesting start for them in their free agency run so far, don't you think? It's been interesting. It's been well. I mean, it hasn't really been quiet on some fronts, but in terms of acquiring players, they haven't really done much. All they did is sign Sam Carrick to a three-year deal, one million per year. Not gonna get not much to say about that, except he's probably will be a fourth liner, or may not even be on the starting lineup in the opening night. The big acquisition, though, on July first, was making the trade to get Riley Smith at twenty-five percent retain, retained, one year left. I, it's he only has one year. He's fine. I'm very whelmed. I thought the Rangers. Were, it sounded like. The vibe I got when the Rangers were eliminated in the conference final is that they knew they had to, they wanted to improve, and they knew they wanted to make some big change. But obviously, that hasn't really happened, and which is weird to me because at this point, it seems like they want to expect some internal improvement. But they themselves even said that it, that might not even be enough, which is weird why they aren't doing anything. But after like, sitting after it for a bit, sitting on it for a bit, with my thoughts, they are definitely saving up money for their cap crunch. Next off season in twenty twenty five, yeah twenty twenty five, where they have like as of right now like seven RFAs that you need to need to sign, along with Igor Shosturkin and also headlining the RFAs, Keandre Miller and Alexi Lafreniere, gonna want big pay raises, so three of those guys, Igor, Keandre and Lafreniere, probably gonna take up like twenty five dollars of. Twenty-five million dollars of cap space minimum, probably. If you if you're signing all of them to big deals, they need they need so they need all the cap space they can get, and maybe that going long on term, like some of the other deals have been signed in uh, the first couple of days in free agency, is not the is not the wise move from um uh, would not have been the wise move for Chris Terry. So in some respects, I think he does get a pass for not. Over, for uh, not indulging in tendencies of NHL GMs, overspend and and over and uh, give too much term. It's it was like a little bit of a worry because you thought the Rangers might try and make some more moves, maybe out of desperation. Yes. To, after their failure to do anything, well, I mean they didn't make the finals after winning the President's Trophy. But are you happy? Are you like dissatisfied? Like, what do you feel? What's the feeling for you so far? I'm I'm definitely whelmed. I mean, but they're basically we're out the same team as last year that won the President's Trophy and went to the conference final, essentially. So I guess they are expecting some internal improvement, but also that's something that's holding up their other end from making other moves is what's going on with Jacob Truba. Is he going to be traded or not? I'm not going to throw any personal details of what's going on with that because I don't think it's in my place, but that's something that's, I think, holding up some stuff. But... If nothing else really changes except for signing Lindgren and Brayden Schneider to uh, deals or bridge deals or whatever, they're basically just going to be rolling out the same lineup as they did last year, which, again, they won the President's Trophy last year. They can fall out of bed and make the playoffs next season, I think, without a doubt. Well, we'll head from one team in New York. We'll head from Manhattan to Long Island and the GM of Lou Lamorello. You know, I I'll say this. Lou Lamorello, I feel like, would be the perfect guy to own a mattress store. You know what I'm saying? You know, you find that perfect mattress, you fall asleep, you lie down on it, and you fall asleep. And you get into that deep slumber, 
and you know that's the perfect mattress. That's what Lou Lamorello has essentially done for at like every important part of the or every important moment for the Islanders in the last couple of years, and that's who we're heading to next. They decided to get help on the wings, and I'm actually a big fan of this move. They went out and got Anthony Duclair, who last offseason was exiled to hockey hell in San Jose. He then had a strong season. I think he got traded again. He got traded to Tampa Bay. He got traded to Tampa. Now is on the Islanders. So I love it. Four years, $14 million. I think it's a strong move. The only problem now is that the Islanders can't do really anything else because, as my favorite saying goes, what the F is cap space? They have about a million left, so they're going to have to fedangle something if they're going to do anything else. But, listen, it's a solid move. I think with the way it's going to happen with them, they're going to be like just on the doorstep of the playoffs. The question is going to be what is that, how good is everyone else? Can Buffalo bounce back? Is the Iser plan out in Detroit going to continue to build and grow? Is some or our team is going to fall off? How are the Washington Capitals? They were barely made it last season. They had a strong off season so far as well. How did the Islanders respond? By being asleep and signing Anthony Duclair. Brilliant, absolutely brilliant. But there was a team that Lou Amorell knows very, very well that wasn't asleep on day number one. Now we will head over across the pond to New Jersey. And Cam, your Devils have had a very solid start to free agency. Yeah, they have given me a ton to chew on. My goodness, I mean, to start things off, it was kind of a foregone conclusion around a couple weeks ago that they were going to go out and sign Brett Pesci off rip. Definitely not tampering. Maybe there's tampering there, and yeah, I'm, I'm gonna be real that there was probably a bunch of tampering there, but you know what? I mean, who doesn't anyway, at this point? Who def- every team, every team, every team does, does all that. Of our, all of our teams here are kind of guilty of it. It's kind of, it's kind of an unwritten rule. It's just everyone's like, yeah, oh, whatever, you can tamper. I mean, like July first, twelve, 12 p.m. is when you're supposed to start talking yeah. to free agents. Yeah, yeah, and then and then all those free agents are signed. Wow, the quick conversations it looks like. And with New Jersey, I love the signing of Brett Pesci. He's not too old. Don't love the term, but he is definitely going to be very nice on the second pairing in Jersey. On top of that, they signed Brendan Dillon, who I think is a little bit riskier of a contract. A $4 million cap hit for a physical defenseman. Not super old, though. He is He has great defensive metrics, and he's not going to have a ton of responsibility. He's going to be on the third pairing. Probably with Simone Nemitz, and that brings me to my next point. Those two signings take a lot of responsibility off Nemitz and Luke Hughes, because last year they were thrown into the the fire, being a big time cornerstone of that defense, logging twenty something minutes a night when they are not at all ready. Nemitz was nineteen, Luke Hughes was twenty, so. They're not at all ready. I think another year of experience under the belt will do them some good. And having some defensively responsible players alongside them will work really well for them as well. On to the forwards for the Devils. I really loved what they did here. There's a lot of upside, not a lot of downside. They signed Stefan Nason, which Luke and I, when we had our conversations leading up to free agency, and when we were looking at the market for the forwards, Stefan Nason was a name that really stuck out to me because former Devil, I've watched him play in 2018. He was a really sound, fundamentally good defensive mm-hmm. forward. And in Carolina, he only elevated that part of his game. He was a scrappy, nasty third liner who could chip in when it mattered. And every single time I watched this team, whether it be against the Devils or in the playoffs, Stefan Nason was doing something. And that is the type of player that the Devils need in their bottom six, and I'm really happy to see him come back on a little bit of term as well for three years, less than $3 million. Really like that signing. On to the maybe top six ad, depending on how much chemistry he has with some of the players. Tomas Tatar is back on New Jersey. I remember last offseason, a lot of speculation as to why Tatar took so long to pick a team is because he wanted to stick in New Jersey and he spent the year with Colorado and Seattle splitting time between the two of them 
he did not play well. In the 22-23 season in New Jersey, he played extraordinarily well. The line with him, Nico Heischer, and Dawson Mercer controlled expected goal percentage at a higher rate than all but, I think, two lines in the NHL that year. Now, sure, Tatar's a couple years older, or like around a year or so, close to two, older, but I believe they're going to put him with Heischer and Mercer, and if it doesn't work, they can just go out and trade for somebody at the deadline. It's a, yeah, it's only like one year, 1.8. It's but not. Yeah, it's not, not bad. A lot of, not bad. Not a lot of downside there. I think the, I think the signings of Pesci and Dylan have more downside potential because of the money combined with the term. I mean, Dylan only three years is not even like that bad. But yeah, I don't think. Yeah, I don't think it's that bad. But that's just sort of my mindset with free agency. I'm always a little bit paranoid about. Ooh, what about these contracts? Mm-hmm. The Devils ended up signing Andre Pallad. A couple years ago and even though he's a solid player like all of his numbers say that he's fine but the term along with his cap it have sort of made him a bit of a target among the devil's fans saying oh the reason why we can extend Dawson Mercer Luke Hughes and Simone Nemitz immediately is because Andre Palat's contract is sitting there and like ruminating for another couple years so there is definitely some issues with some of the deals that they handed out, but hey, again, it's not super high risk. And around the league, this is a thing that everybody just seems to do. They love giving out term and money mm-hmm. to mid-tier players who don't deserve that term and money. There are a few exceptions, and the a player that the Devils signed as one of them. When Dougie Hamilton hit the free agent market, he deserved that contract that he got because he is an elite player who was hitting the market when he was still at an age where he was projected to still play at an elite level for a long time. That doesn't happen very often in unrestricted free agency. And I'm going to pull up the number right here. Uncap friendly. On day one of free agency, the NHL as a whole spent $1.2 billion on total contracts. I guarantee you within the next two years, they're going to try and move $900 million of that. It's outrageous, but we do, uh, before we segue into our winners and losers of day number one, we do have some breaking news. Another signing has occurred. Oh. It's Vladimir <laughs> Tarasenko. Ooh. He has signed two the Motor City of Detroit. Whoa. Two years, 4.75 AAV for like Vladimir that. Tarasenko. The Wait, Iser so- plan is inevitable. They will never die. Two years, 4.75 million a year for Vladimir Tarasenko to the, to the so, Red Wings. So, so they now have Tarasenko, Kane, and Tyler Mott. What Didn't is this, Kane a 2020? No, he's dying back. That's, oh, that's the Rangers... Back. That's the Rangers' 2023 deadline right there. That got yes, them, sir. that lost them to the freaking Devils. The, the Detroit Rangers are at it again. The Detroit, Detroit Rangers. And they might get Jake. And they get Eric Gustafson. They might get Jake. They, Tr- they might get true. They might get true, but I don't know. That's their formula. <laughs> yeah, cause, yeah, because that worked out so well initially for Tampa Bay and Carolina. It did. No, it did, it did not. And, and, okay, Tampa Bay. It actually. Worked. Well, they, all they had was Mc, all they had left was McDonough. You know, they actually <laughs> McDonough from that whole that whole phase when they were taking Ranger True. players. A pretty big part. Yes, but that was but they had like guys like Miller, Girardi, Boyle, and whatnot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know, I know. But so let's parallel our way after being reacting to Vladimir Tarasenko actually getting money. Uh, we will now be heading over to our winners and losers of day one and. Luke, you really like the certain team down in the Music City. I mean, I like what they did in, to, in uh, on July first. I know, it, I know, it goes against it goes against like Cam's whole thing about giving turn to older players. But like, I mean, when you had a chance to sign like Steven Sankos or Jonathan Marchesso, Marchesso, a Con Smythe winner. Yes, they're both pretty old, but it sends a, a message to the team that did that made the playoffs last year had cap space and it sends a message to the fans that they are committed to winning 
and that is and that is something that I think really changes the franchise. And these signings make them better. They also signed Brady Shea to a pretty rich deal, if I'm going to be honest. A pretty rich deal, though he was important to Carolina. Though I have uh, my my um, own experiences with Brady Shea when he was a Ranger, and he was he was fine. I liked him, but like seven million for seven years seems a bit much, and he's already thirty. Yeah. He though his his game might age well because he's he plays a much more like a puck moving defenseman type of uh, game, so it might age pretty well for the most part. But I mean, still. I think Nashville has like improved their team immensely, and they are f- going to be a force in the Western Conference this year. Professional streamer here, chat. Professional streamer here. I muted myself, and I said, I'll- uh, I- <laughs> "Y'all can we get yeah." When this goes live, and the chat goes live. Y'all can write GGs in the chat, please. <laughs> that would be hilarious. But yeah, professional streamer, but. Uh, I, my pick for this, uh, so Luke went with Nashville, and I was originally going to go with Boston, because, you know, they got Lindholm, and the other player, I keep forgetting his name, Zadorov. Uh, and, that, and Zadorov from Vancouver. I'm like, oh, good move, good move. But there was another team that I, after the, fi- the recording failed, there was another team that I liked that made moves instead, and that is in the nation's capital. Now, I... Briefly mentioned Washington. They went out and got Pierre Luc Dubois, Andrew Ma- Magnapane, and Logan Majapani. Majapani. Maj- and, oh, and, and, and they traded and Jacob Chikrin they traded for. I know. And they signed Matt. And they oh and they and the other signing they made. They traded for Jacob Chitrin for essentially a pair of a bag of chips, and they added Matt Roy. Now. Roy, it's a it's a little bit much for me. Five and a half I million mean, a year for was it seven years? That's a lot, but I could I kind of get why you can ju- you can justify it. I think a bit. He's a good defender, but yeah, it, it is a, a lot. Defender. But you know, Washington, you know they. I mean, they made it into the playoffs on the last day. They had to do something in a free agency. Then they went out and gave decent terms to some solid players. I'm not. I, I you get what they're trying to do yes are they trying to hold on to the ages of the past when they had Ovechkin and Backstrom and TJ Oshie flying everywhere winning a Stanley Cup I mean or even before that being the NHL's Los Angeles Clippers and failing to get past the second round second round but listen they're trying to do what I would call the Pittsburgh Detroit method of barely staying relevant and trying to make the first round for like for the next however long because that's what they're essentially trying to do they're not going to win the metro they're not going to make it past the first round 90 i'm 95 percent sure they're probably not going to make it past the first round because i don't see them beating a team like in new jersey i don't see them beating a rangers i mean could they beat somebody else sure but they really haven't done enough and their core is so old that i just have no confidence in them they have a hundred million dollar payroll right now i know yeah, they're gonna have to. Yeah, I, I mean yikes. they're gonna put I, they're they're gonna put like uh, Oshi and um and Backstrom on LTIR for sure to get cap compliant. V- Vegas, you're learning the Vegas method, the dark oh, yeah. arts of Las Vegas. I, you know, it's it's just I like the moves that Washington made, but the one thing they are a Charlie Lindgren turning to a pumpkin away from being not so good. Yes, that they is my indeed. one thing. They're like on the doorstep of being really terrible. Cam, there's another team that you like the moves of. Talk to us about them. What team are you thinking? I kind of liked the moves of Carolina because they didn't take too many risks. I like the signing of Carrier, even though they did lose a lot. They did lose a lot. They did. They lost. They did. No, I mean, the Devils practically skinned them with Pesci and Nason. Do big. <laughs> components of, of their team but they kind of reloaded Carrier's uh, analytical darling they went with the they went with the analytical darlings and I when I, mean, I look at teams I don't like there's a lot more that I don't like as opposed to what I do like in NHL free agency just because of my mindset toward it it's a ton of bad value 
And when I look at a bad value contract, I think the king of the bad value contracts is the deal that Seattle gave to Chandler Stevenson. Oh, yeah. Christ. Ooh, like, yeah. Lord. Like, he is... Like, he, he He's a fine player. Check all the boxes of nightmare signing. He is on the wrong side of 30. Well, he, he only just turned 30, but yeah, he's about to be on the thrines. 30 is still 30. Yes. He's, like, he's 30. He's the he highest paid ton, player like, on the he team. Got a ton of assists, which meant he played with forwards. a lot of good players who he's not going to play with anymore. I, and the big problem... And it's a oh, yeah. ton of term. A ton Did of he just term. crash again? He's not going to be... I, I think not be I think you're fine, Robbie. You're good. You're, fine. you're good. Like, you're fine, but like he's not going to be playing with talented players like he was in Vegas, where he can get 40 assists. So a ton of his production's going to go down, and it's a seven point something million dollar cap hit over seven years. Well, it's it's, it's thirty seven. It's six two. It's six two five million. Okay, six two five million. Like it's still. It's still a lot. Terrible. It's still a ton of money for a guy like Chandler Stevenson is not a six million dollar player over the span of seven years. I, it's and also it's just like Seattle's biggest problem. They were 29th in goals in goals. Chandler Stevenson does not score goals. He is very much a playmaker. So they could put him with like Jared McCann, who's a good goal scorer. But it's just he. It's like the same problem with Johnny Goudreau. It's like, oh, he's he's mainly a playmaker, so he's gonna turn all these guys in Columbus into finishers. And that didn't very that very much did not happen at all. Columbus was like worse at goal was like so bad, and like this has the same makings up to being like a similar fate for Taylor Stevenson. I love hearing about the oh yes you do. He, I can't believe he. I can't believe he got like forty, like over forty assists on that team though, too. At the same time, that is wild. By the way, that's absolutely he's, wild. He's, I mean, eh, he he's happy with his. No he's, dating, he's got he, and, uh, and getting springs and summers off. I mean, he's got his friend now too, Sean Monahan. Yeah, reunited. Right. Yeah, it's a big contract. Yeah. But the one team I'm like perplexed on, I'll be honest with y'all. Toronto. The, <laughs> I, it's a, they're a weird one. I'm going to pick Toronto. What the hell is that TANF contract? What uh, are we doing? He's Guys. totally getting. I, yes, he was solid on the, the Dallas Stars, but. He was really solid, but yeah, he's 34. 4.5 million a year for, it says six years on my thing, but I think that's wrong. It's not six years. Though it's six it's, years. He's getting banished to Robbie Dot Island by like halfway through that contract for yeah. sure. Listen, he should just buy a house in freaking Aruba and just because eventually he's gonna get waived, so he's gonna have to go somewhere. I almost just felt my chair almost just broke. Brilliant. <laughs> but um, this this show has everything today. Wi-Fi is crashing. Me almost breaking my chair. Random talk about hockey. It's perfect. But back to my boy Chris Tanev, who I like Chris Tanev. I mean, I've known about him for a pretty long time. But four and a half million a year for six years for a dude that's like what thirty four. Yeah. Jesus, Christ. that's desperation. It I... is desperation. I mean, you thought it was when Kyle Dubis was there, it was gonna be bad. But Jesus, like, and then he gets fired, and then they have who's our GM now? Brad. Brad Tree Living. Brad Tree Living. He I almost said likes... Living. I almost said Living Tree. So that's when you know I'm <laughs> I'm good with the names. I mean, at least. Ah, oh, Jesus Christ. But the other movie that I thought was weird is OEL. Just, you will get I mean, place, just add the age. They're they're basically going for, like, the significantly older route, which doesn't typically work, I would say. I mean, uh, OEL is, like, of it. I, OEL is, like, okay, but, like, I feel like he's, like, he was playing, like, sheltered minutes in Florida, and right. I feel like Toronto's going to ask him to do a lot more than what he probably can do at this point of his career. I agree. I mean, also, they signed Yanni Hockenpah, who they might not have actually signed after all. 
I don't know. Yeah, that was the other thing I was gonna bring up because I'm like, did they sign him? Did they not sign him? Like, I, what the- he's listed here. He's listed here at, at um on cap friendly on their roster, but I don't think they actually signed him because he might his career might actually be over. Oh, brilliant! Absolutely brilliant. Yes, yeah, so the cap friendly might is gonna. I think is gonna be going dead. Going to be oh dead. yeah, and like a, and like in like a couple days, yeah. GG's in the chat. G- they had a big acquisition G- by the Caps this year. For cap friendly, which has been like the one thing how I followed NHL free agency for the last oh yeah how many years but as everyone does every hockey yeah well, I'm, well Washington's incompetence gets in the way and they know. I mean it's another big acquisition I mean yeah there's their free agency acquisition of signing cap friendly to a million uh, to a giant contract but yeah Luke before we send you guys off what was a team that you weren't a big fan of from the first day of free agency I was confused at level with the Kings were doing and you know. It reeked a lot of Mark Bergevin. He's a part of their uh, front office, I think. And Rob Blake... <sighs> Rob Blake has not been good as King GM. I've just got to say that. He has Boys not Club. been good. Yep, Boys, Boys Club. Club but, there, um... Yeah. But, so, they signed Warren Fogel to a three-year by three... Three and a half million dollars per year for three years. That's not a bad signing. He's he's, def- he's definitely a... Su- but he's definitely a depth a death piece. They traded for Tanner Janelle for one year left of Tanner Janelle. They traded a second round pick to get him, I think. Jeez. Jeez. That's, he's not going to help you with goal scoring. That's for sure. They traded a second round pick for this man? And I, think a, and I think a fourth round or some other pick too. Oh my god. Uh, the hockey uh, men go crazy for grit and sandpaper oh, and good you ta- and tangibles. The Mark Bergevin special. And also, speaking of Mark Bergevin special... Th- four years at three point eight five million for Joel Edmondson is quite the move. It's quite the move to say the least. This team screams first round exit to the Oilers again. <laughs> That's all I'm gonna say. This team is they who 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 do they beat? Who can they beat? Who which team is this beat? Which team are the Kings gonna beat? Not certainly not Edmonton. Not Colorado, not Dallas, certainly not Nashville, not Vancouver, not Vegas. Who, who, who in the in the elite of the of the Western Conference are they going to beat? They had their Utah. chance. There's your answer, Utah. <laughs> San Jose, maybe. <laughs> San Jose, Utah, and uh, Calgary. There's your answer. Yeah, yeah, maybe. But it's just I, they needed to do. I felt like they needed to do more to capitalize on their window, and they really have. They have not done much, and they've really squandered their potential. Then some bad, in some bad, or trades have aged pretty poorly. Like the Kevin Fiala, even though Kevin Fiala has been good for them, and he's been really good for them. They traded away Brock Faber, who was a finalist for the Calder this year. Yeah, and a first round pick. I didn't like. That, that's just that's just the start of it. He, they, they still have dead cap from Ivan Provorov on their on their salary cap. Still, when they had yeah, when they had to get rid of of uh, Cal Peterson. Dump off his oh, salary. All right, yeah. And they're still paying a ton of money for Mike Mike Richards' terminated contract. Jesus. <laughs> I, I, oh, I, I, ha- I it's just I'm just perplexed by what some of their moves have been, and it does I think this team is not going is they're saying the same, and I think it's a bad move for them. I'm, I mean, at this rate, I want to know what Mark Bergevin's drinking. I mean, I'm just drinking this lemon, uh, this half and half Snapple here. But at this rate, I want to know what Mark Bergevin's drinking and his front that front office is drinking because it uh, must be beautiful, must be miraculous for thinking yep. that these moves are so most of these moves were competent other than Fogel. Jesus Christ, guys. Yep. So, um, I have a fun fact to drop before I go. Like, let's hear it. Luke bringing up Mike Richards made me think of it. This is the last year that the New Jersey Devils. Oh, uh, for, for Ilya Kovalchuk. For, for Ilya Kovalchuk. Still. Recapture penalty. This Jeez. is the last Today, year. Our, this is the last payment of two hundred fifty thousand dollars they have to issue out to Ilya Kovalchuk this year. My God, guys, come on. Ilya Kovalchuk. What a player. Oh, boy, that saga. That saga. You want to talk about Lou Lamorello, dude? He was doing this type of stuff. Late, like, later in his devil's career. Yeah, like yeah. 15 years ago, he tried bullying this with And he was old then. Yeah, yeah, he was old. Even then, like, he was... Super like, old he, then. He built the 
the cup teams in the 90s. He, was he old Zen too? Still? Yes. Yeah. He, he has looked. Definitely. He's looked. He's looked 80 ever since he was 50. Brilliant. Absolutely and, and, brilliant. And in, and in the 2010, like in 2012, we were still looking at some moves like. Ugh, Ooh, don't know about that one, Lou. Getting up there. Ooh. Yikes. Absolute yikes. Well, after talking about old man Lou Lamorello and NHL free agencies start, unfortunately, we will have to see some of our, our friends go and we'll be saying goodbye to Cam and Luke. But before we go, we'll start with Cam again because I know you like shout outs on this, on this channel. Uh, you can shout out your 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 uh, socials or whatever first. Go ahead, mate. Um, you can follow me on Twitter at Cam Willie Show. You can follow me on Twitch at Franken underscore RL. I'm trying to get to 100 followers on there. I'm at 47 right now, so I'd appreciate some of the boosting. Um, on my TikTok, you can just search up my name and you can find me there. On YouTube, you can search up my name. You'll find my podcast where I talk about sports. Unfortunately, I am not going to be able to record it this week. But next week, we will have the 200th episode of the Cameron Bully Show. So, I'm well done, much. sir. Well done. I am very much excited for that. I know I've been working on that show since I was 14. So I'm definitely Jeez. excited for that. So, anyways, that's about all the shout-outs I have. Uh, and then we'll uh, pass it over uh, to Luke, who you can give a couple of shout-outs if you want now. Yeah, um, you can follow me on Twitter at Luke H. Dolan. That's fine. That, um, and then follow me and Cam's show at, at WIOR, Ball Knowers, whenever, starting next semester up again when uh, school starts. That's about it. Where I'll be talking about the range primarily. These guys know what's going on these guys i mean we did an nfl draft show together for four hours we were going crazy on stream that was uh so you guys fun. that oh was my really God. fun that, that's the greatest stream i've ever done like i know i've done into the stands for a long time it's been two years now with those guys that was probably the craziest stream of them all even which was unfortunately the one they weren't there but we've had some crazy streams You'll be able to see me and these boys on WIUR in a brand new studio come oh, September. Yeah. I actually That's have to see right. it in a couple of weeks. And right. I have to actually have to see it soon, which is absolutely insane. But I unfortunately, we will be saying goodbye to our friends Cam, Luke. It was a pleasure having you boys on. You guys can now leave the call. Uh, and hopefully after this, this video won't crash. That's the Happy hope. Happy 4th of Thank July. Again, boys. Yeah, Happy 4th of July. Happy 4th of July, lads. Take care. Luke, Deuce is my friend. Chat, what do we think of them? I mean, they were pretty good, right? Uh, make sure to hit their uh, links in the description. But we will be, for the sake of this video not crashing again, we're going to now speed run through some of our topics today. And that begins with Euro 2024. We have completed uh, our round of 16. And we kicked this off with our friends from Italy, who I had a lot of questions for Italy. They played Switzerland, and they got ran off the field. I'm just going to put it to you straight. They got their butts ran off the field. They lost 2-0. They didn't deserve to be in this match. They lost 2-0. Uh, Germany, the host, then played Denmark. Game went back and forth for a little bit, but I think Denmark may have had a goal disallowed and a penalty disallowed. Germany went on, grabbed two goals. They come out and win. Sunday... We then pivot over to Sunday, and we have Georgia. We we well, we were praising Georgia in the last video. I was praising Georgia. You know, they had the greatest Euros upset of all time. They did all this crazy stuff. They then get uh, absolutely destroyed by Spain. Uh, they got an own goal. Spain score four. Four is greater than one. They win this match. And then England-Slovakia, which we were supposed to watch highlights for. Unfortunately, for the time, and hopefully this video not crashing... We will not be watching highlights this week. So England, they were struggling. Slovakia score early on, a brilliant one-two. Some of the defense is asleep. Slovakia goes out and scores. England did not really have a shot on goal for the majority of this game. They were slow. They were not. They're not energized. But then, very late on, 95th minute, the last kick of regulation. Jude Bellingham, brilliant finish. A bicycle kick in the 95th minute from six yards out levels our match and then immediately into extra time we go 
Harry Kane, after two deflections, gets the ball right, gets the ball right to him, finishes, finishes it, and they go two and up past Dubrovka, and Slovakia fall to England. Listen, England shouldn't have won, but my God, Slovakia blew it. S Slovakia did this to themselves for the most part, but no one else did this to themselves. The it was Belgium in the battle of the food groups. We have the baguette of France taking on the waffles of Belgium. And, well, Waffle Land went out and lost to the baguette 1-0, courtesy of an own goal. France has played four matches. Count them. One, two, three, four. They have zero goals from open play. Zero. Nada. Zero. Zero. They have one penalty kick from Mbappe, and the rest were own goals. God, I love this sport. They won 1-0. They'll advance to the quarterfinals. They'll be playing Portugal, who played a absolutely stormer in a game that I said was going to be a trap game for Portugal. Slovenia have nothing to lose. They barely made it to the knockouts. They've drawn three matches, but they just don't know how to score. But they also know how to defend really well. And Ronaldo had a penalty saved late on into the match. And then one, um, past the 110th minute, Ben Sheshko 1v1 saved by Costa. It was incredible. Penalty shootout comes, three saves by Costa again in net. Absolutely brilliant stuff. Ronaldo converts a pen, Portugal get two others, and Portugal advances to the quarterfinals while doing absolutely nothing. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. We then headed to, into Tuesday. It was a little bit more, um, more expected. You know, Romania got absolutely annihilated, as expected. Uh, the Netherlands went out and won, and then Austria. Listen, screw winning a group at this point, because apparently winning a group just means you play terrible. Listen, at this point, I, I'm other if you're not Spain or Germany, winning a group doesn't mean really anything, because Austria went out and got beaten up by Turkey. Turkey grabbed two goals, including one in the first minute of the match. Right away, Turkey right, goes right into it, just grabs their goal. It was 1-1, but I believe it was 1-1. Turkey goes up 2-1. They win the match 2-1. They go to the quarterfinals. In this tree, which I hope will work this time, it should work. It does work. It's Spain, Germany, Portugal, France. But then on the other side, a more open seed. We, on This is for Saturday. We have Netherlands, Turkey, England, Switzerland. No one knowing what's going on. And I'm all for it. Absolutely all for it. Um, matches to watch out for. I actually did predict to one of the games, uh, in the pre-tournament predictions, which shout out to me, uh, Spain, Germany, I did have actually happening, which fitting, but, um, if, if you want me to pick a team to get out of this tree, Germany and Spain, the winner of that, they've looked the best. The difference is I like the matchups that Germany had, you know, they've actually faced some problems. Spain really haven't, and they haven't been able to handle the adversity yet. Germany in the home world, home Euros, I like them going through. I like them going up to play against Portugal. I, France, not scoring a goal from open play has been a big problem for me. But they've also been defending really well. So I, I, it's, this game is so hard to pick. I'm going to go with Portugal. I'm going to go against my actual tournament prediction. No, it's screw. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to pick France. But then I have Germany going into the final. I'm not picking France past this. I think Ronaldo gets bounced. Though I think, listen, would it be cool to see, like, Ronaldo win this again, go to the finalissima against Messi, possibly? Yes. But you, we won't see that much corruption, possibly. But it's possible. I like the Netherlands to beat Turkey. The Netherlands looked really good. Turkey actually looked really good in their match with Austria, which was shocking to me. But I'm going to go pick the Netherlands. Then I actually kind of like Switzerland. You know, they looked really dominant against a decent Italy team. You know, they have a lot of talent. They were the defending champions. But Switzerland have played this whole thing with nothing to lose. I think they're going to do it here against England. I'm going to have Netherlands face Switzerland with the Netherlands going to the final against... Uh, Who do I have? Oh, yeah, Germany. That would be absolutely chaos. A team... So it would be another uh, international tournament where a team that finished third in the group made the final. But the last time it happened, they won. Are we seeing a trend from AFCON now where, like, the teams in third make it far in tournaments? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know, chat. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, moving on, uh, we do still have a couple of topics remaining. 
And one of them is the Copa America, which is where we'll be heading next. And, you know, Saturday, what was the storyline into Saturday? Argentina were already through. Chile and Canada, someone had to win or Canada was going to go through. Well, what happened? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Canada went out and goes out and draws Chile nil-nil. Perfect. Absolutely perfect. Listen, at this point, just don't even play the match. It's a nil-nil. Nothing happened. Argentina beats Peru in a match that Argentina dominated. Again, they go to the events to the quarterfinals. And by the bare minimum, because they scored an extremely late winner against a 10-man Peru, Canada is through to the knockouts on four points. Sure. Why not? At least at least they can there's a team that can beat Peru in going to the knockouts. Group B was also weird. Because Mexico was in a very uncomfortable position. You know, at least one CONCACAF team made the knockouts. Could we possibly see two? Jamaica had nothing really to play for. So naturally, they got beaten up by Venezuela, which set up the stage for Ecuador against Mexico. A winner would send one of the teams through, but a draw would send Ecuador through. The winner and going to this game is... No one. It ended in nil-nil. <laughs> Listen, the, 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 the nil-nils are just dominating the, the last day of group stage play for the most part. I mean, listen, at this rate, every game should be nil-nil because really, not a lot of them have been actually that good. Venezuela went out and beat Jamaica, as mentioned. Ecuador and Mexico played another boring nil, semi-boring nil-nil. And because nothing happened, Ecuador advances to the knockouts and jumped three for four on teams going into the knockouts so far. This is where it gets odd. Group C... I know I'm rushing through this a little bit, and I'll make some comments about the officiating, although we won't have any video for you guys, but you guys can totally check out the video for this game in a minute. Other match. Bolivia was playing Panama. If the U.S. had any chance of making it through, they needed Bolivia to get at least a point. The United States were playing a full, fully, full squad of Uruguay, who have looked great in the first two matches. They dominated Panama, and then they dominated Bolivia. They beat Bolivia 5-0 for freaking for frick's sake. So, at this rate, the United States needed to win. And what did the United States do? They promptly went out and lost. And since Panama won, the United States are out in their home tournament. This is a typo, right? I mean, at this rate, this is just perfect. And the, the, cut the screen. Cut the screen. Now, yes, was the officiating of this match terrible? They played advantage on a yellow card. No one knew what was happening. But understand this. Greg Berhalter, I don't like him very much. And you guys have heard me rant about him before. But Jesus Christ, what the hell was this tournament? It's the first ever host of a Copa America to get eliminated in their groups. And this tournament has gone, gone on for 100 years plus. This is the longest reigning Continental competition. Ever. Not AFCON, not the Asian Cup, not the Oceania Championships, or whatever the hell they're called. Not the Gold Cup, surely. It's Copa America. It's not the Euros, Copa America. How does this happen? No idea. I don't even know what to say. This was a pathetic showing by the United States men's national team. And something has to change. And good news, we actually might be seeing change. Thank God, because, I'll be honest, this team looked uninspired. The team wasn't disciplined. Tim Weah got a red card for looking like a complete idiot. Now, I have nothing against Tim Weah. I love Tim Weah, but what are we doing, bro? Come on, man. Tim Weah is one of the smartest players on the field and goes out and throws an elbow at somebody. That was miraculous, by the way. But the one thing that I'll always have a problem with is like sometimes big players don't show up in big moments for this national team. And guess what? That 100% happened again because nothing. Pulisic was kind of irrelevant for most of the last two games. Though I'll give him some credit. He was getting man-marked really well. So I'm not going to throw a lot of shade at Pulisic because I just don't do that. But some areas of the midfield were not great. Gio Reyna, not great. Balogun was good. And, I mean, listen, Balogun was good until he got injured. He did get injured in this match. 
The, de- the defense, I like Chris Richards. I thought he was fine. Joe Scally looked really strong. Jedi Robinson's going to be fine. <coughs> the question will always be, who's the other center back? When the future will be Cameron Carter-Vickers? Will it be Miles Robinson returning? At this point, we don't know because Tim Ream's really old. So we don't know who the other center back is going to be for the World Cup. It's a big question mark going forward 100%. Matt Turner, I thought, was fine. I know people, a lot of people are throwing shade on him for not saving that free kick that led to the goal. But, like, I, I don't know I, I don't know what he wanted to do. It's a brilliant save, by the way. Uh, but no one was following the rebound. There's your goal. So let me go to my explanations for this game. Before we go into the... No, before we do that, let's go into some Greg Berhalter talk again. This was a statement said by Matt Crocker. And this was about the review of the national team setup. They're doing a, a major review of this. He says, Our tournament performance fell short of our expectations. We must do better. We will be conducting a comprehensive review of our performance in Copa America and how best to improve the team and results as we look forward for the World Cup in 2026. Now, Matt Crocker is a very interesting person. Last year, if you follow the women's game, I really don't follow the women's game. That's why I don't talk about it here. The Women's World Cup, the United States got eliminated really, really early. And what happened... Matt Crocker said something very similar to this and then sacked the coach. So could we possibly see something here? I mean, at this rate, the biggest supporter group of U.S. soccer is calling for Greg Berhalter to be sacked, which one perfect. But also, it's the first time they've ever done that. The American Outlaws is a big group of supporters for the United States men's national team. And they are calling for Greg Berhalter to be sacked. I found that I now have more confidence and the belief that it's going to happen. But, listen, not, not a lot of crazy things happen, but we finish it up. Um, oh, by the way, no, actually, before we go to this, let's go to my explanations. Was the goal, should the goal have counted? I don't know. The reason I'm going to say I don't know is, it's, it's very simple. The angles that Connemble have on the goal... I mean, Stu Holden said, well, you're not on the line. So you can't really tell. So I'm going to say I don't know to that. I mean, he looked off sides. I think, like, the front of his knee was off. But it sucks not having semi-automated off sides for a tournament like this. I think in the future, for how good semi-automated off sides looks in the Euros, oh, yeah, we'll see it in Copa America. I think we'll see it in the Premier. I think every top five league should have that. 100%. 100%. Semi-automated offsides is like has been absolutely perfect. Exactly what I was hoping it was going to be. And I think it'll be a, a perfect thing to install into the world's game. I don't have a problem with it. I actually think it's been really strong. But if they had semi-automated offsides, I think that goal could have been disallowed. Could have. Not would have been. I think could have. Because you can't really tell from the angle. Now, what was the other restart I'm going to talk about? Ah, Yes. There was an instance, I believe it was in the second half. No, it was in the first half. Uruguay got a foul. Like, like, the United States conceded a foul. As Chris Richards, late slide tackle, yellow card. Uruguay plays fast and then leads to a goal score opportunity where Tim Ream actually clears it off the line. And everyone's confused on what just happened because the referee gave an advantage while a yellow card was in his hand. I've never, I've seen a lot of crazy things in my life. As a referee, as an outsider, I have my, I don't have my badge on me, but I am a a certified referee, so I know what the laws are. I've never seen that before. I have watched some of the craziest, poorly officiated games. You would not see a moment like this in a grassroots game in the United States. I'm 95% sure of that. Especially the games I would, I've seen. I've refereed for six years. I've never seen that before in any of my matches. Never. As an AR, I've never done it as a center because you're supposed to blow the whistle for the foul, point direction. You can't really see my arm, so I'll go like that. Point direction, blow the whistle again, and then go to the book and give out a card. I'll just give the motion for that card. I have my cards on me. That's what it's supposed to be. But no, 
Referee's taking the cards out. He's got to talk to Richards, and then he points his hands out for freaking his point hand out for freaking advantage while the cards in his hand. I know I like Italian. I am Italian. I'm doing like the Italian motion, but he does like this. What the hell is that? Bro, you're a certified referee for condom bowl. Come on, guys. Listen, referees deserve to get sometimes get a lot of crap. That's one of them. And to make it all worse, he didn't shake hands with Polisic because he kept arguing his calls. Brilliant. Perfect. I don't have a problem with that from Polisic. I don't. I'm ta I'm done being mad about this team. The U.S. deserve to lose. Listen, the officiating was bad, the field sucked, but the U.S. just couldn't connect passes, and they couldn't really do anything right. And they deserve to lose this match. So now we go to last night. The situation was simple. Brazil needed a point, and they needed some... I mean, they didn't really need help, but it could have been all... It was all up for grabs. And Costa Rica went out and won a match, which fair play to them. I was I did not have faith in CONCACAF for this. They went out and won. Colombia then played Brazil at the same time, ended 1-1. This is where it gets even better. Brazil were robbed of a penalty, which I did think was a penalty, by the way. And then we had this happen come out right afterwards. Um, I hope I have the vi I know I don't have it. But, um, essentially, I don't have the exact word for word. It's, uh, more or less, it's, we, we screwed up. It, Vinicius Jr. should have been awarded a penalty. I don't know how this didn't, like, VR didn't overturn it. I don't know. I, I just don't know anymore. But here, that's how this group ends. We'll take a look at the groups again before we look at the tree. This is how the group stage ends for Copa America. We'll stop this sharing here. We'll load up the standings now. Uh, here, we'll actually just go to the quarterfinals. Screw it, let's go. Here is your quarterfinals of Copa America. Uh, Argentina is playing Ecuador. Winner goes to MetLife Stadium to play either Venezuela or Canada. Uruguay plays Brazil in a match that can go either way. Uruguay's looked really good. I'd back Uruguay here. And Colombia's playing Panama, a Panamanian team that has nothing to lose. Listen. Okay. I think this is a free path for Colombia to make the final. I, I this Colombia have been unbeaten for like their last 27 games or whatever it is. And they have deserved to be unbeaten for their last 27 games. I think this can go either way. Uh, I think Colombia is going to beat Panama. I have Uruguay beating Brazil. I have Venezuela beating Canada and Argentina beating Ecuador. Then I have Argentina beat Venezuela at MetLife. I actually might be there for that, so make sure to check out the channel because I might be missing next Tuesday's video. Possibly. I don't know. Uh, and then Venezuela plays Canada in a match that, I mean, Argentina is going to beat Venezuela. Uruguay is going to play Colombia. I back Colombia. Colombia have looked better. So I'm going to go argentina Colombia final. That's perfect. Argentina-Brazil would have been more perfect, but argentina Colombia, I think right now, the way it's all panning out, the two best teams in Condom Bowl would be a perfect final. I'm not picking the final because it's all to play for, but yeah, a lot of crazy stuff has happened. But we will move on to tennis. No, we're not. We are talking F1 first before tennis absolutely talking about this first austria what a race first of all i didn't get to watch all of it i didn't get to watch like the middle part of it but my god what a race austria is, is one of my favorite tracks if you didn't know i love austria the red bull ring is like a beautiful track i ha i lost a lot of hope after max's opening the start of the race but my god what the finish was be was absolutely beautiful if you don't know what I'm talking about, uh, this race was basically a two-headed two-man race uh, in the in the main event between Max Verstappen and Lando Norris. And very late into the race, with I believe five or six laps to go, into turn three, which is this long, like, like a sharper right, they come together. Lando's out because of this, and Max finishes. MP5. 
I think he may have had the pit as well. I don't know what happened with that part. But it, it, here's my here's what I say. Norris and Max crash. Off they go. Through goes George Russell. George Russell gets the most undeserved Formula One win of the year. He wins 1.9 seconds ahead of Piastri, Carlos Sainz, and then Hamilton. Verstappen, Nico Hulkenberg, Sergio Perez, K-Mag, Daniel Ricciardo gets points along with Pierre Gasly. Uh, you're probably wondering, where is Charles Leclerc? He got tagged in the opening corner. Yeah. Uh, sorry, it was uh, turn three as well. So turn three was, it was the uh, the evil the evil goer of this race. But more essentially, if that t- crash didn't happen, it's Max Lando. But like now we might see that friendship because we knew Max and Lando were good friends. That might change because... I mean, who do I think is at fault? I think it's both of them. Lando was pretty far back, but Max didn't, like, kind of shove them off the road, which is a very Max Verstappen thing to do. We've seen that happen a lot. So, I don't know. It's a very, I think it's a 50-50 for me. But, you know, the race was awesome. The weekend was great. Max won the sprint. Um, Right behind him was Oscar Piastri. Lando got really unlucky this week. Yeah, he got P3, but, I mean, my goodness. It was, it was a great sprint. It was a great sprint, great race. They now head uh, over to Silverstone, which we'll be talking about in the next video, which will actually be on Saturday. It will not be Friday. It will be on Saturday. Finally, let's talk about Wimbledon because it's been an... Uh, how do I word this? It's been a start to Wimbledon. I mean, I'm happy. Uh, the draw has been good. Let's take a look at the draw itself. We might be going a little bit longer into this because it's a, it's a full draw. We'll, t- we'll show you all the results. In the men's side, we'll start with here. Uh, Yannick dropped a set somehow against Better than Tini. Okay, that's, the f- that's not even the right round. First round, Yannick drops a set against Hanifman. Uh, Berentini won... Uh, we'll find our Shapovalov upset of Jari. I kind of called this. Uh, Harris beat Mikhailson. Ben Shelton won an uncomfortable match against Bellucci, which I got to watch the end of it. Great match between him and Bellucci. Dimitrov, great. Uh, Zhang, good match. Uh, got tight a little bit in that first set against Garin, uh, from what I know of at least. But no, nah, it was a good. It was a good match. I thought it was fine. Uh, solid. Stan Varenka will face Gail Malfis. So, the one of the most fun players to watch versus one of the older players in the draw. Uh, Zhang beat Janvier. Uh, Struf won. Muller. Daniil Medvedev looked awesome against Kovacic. Alcaraz beats the player from Estonia. Vukic won over Offner. Great match here as well. 10-8 in the tiebreak in the fifth set. Korich won over Melgeni Alves. Uh, Tiafa won a very uncomfortable match against Arnaldi. We'll talk about him in a minute. Uh, Baez, who I thought could have maybe done something, but was possibly in a trap side of the draw, faced Nakashima, and Nakashima won early. And then we have Thompson beat Kotov after dropping the first two sets, 7-5, 7-5, then won three straight sets at the same score. Kind of odd. Uh, Van de Zenschulp. I totally said that wrong, but bear with me here. Won his first round match. Umpert won. Tommy Paul. Virtanon. Kazakhs. Bublik. Sonego upset Navone. Batista Agut went out and won his opening match. For uh, Fonini went out and won in Kasparud. Uh, won that half. We'll go to the second half of the draw. Andre Rublev. Actually, no, we'll stay with the first half and we'll go over their second round action because that's where they are now. Sinner beat Berrentini. Decent. I, I got to watch this match. It was okay. Nothing crazy. Greek Spore getting upset. I called it with Greek Spore. Uh, he lost to Kemanovic from Serbia. Totally said that right. Whatever. Shapovalov is yet to play Altamir. Ben Shelton's facing Harris, Dimitrov, and Zhang. Uh, we'll see these matches tomorrow. Uh, Zhang lost, which after the way that first set went, I thought Zhang was going to win. But uh, Struve rallied, including two tiebreak wins. 
Um, Muller lost to Medvedev rather predictably, though the first set they go to a tie break. Alcaraz beat Vukic, so he has yet to drop a set. And he'll face Francis Tiafa, which I actually predicted correctly. Nakashima will face Umber, also kind of expected. This is going to be fun. Tommy Paul and Bublik on, on I believe that will be on Friday. Great match. I think it's going to be back and forth all day long. Awesome match. This one hurt because I love Kasparud. He lost to Fonini. He didn't deserve it. He didn't deserve it. I mean, Fonini won the first two sets. Rude won the tiebreak, and I thought he could maybe come back, but Fonini won the third set, the fourth set, and that was it. Casper Rude, one of the favorites, and one of the guys I almost picked, goes out early. In the second half of the draw, first round action. Um, yep, there we go. Uh, Andre Rublev out immediately. I knew I wasn't going to pick him. That's why he went out and lost in a beautiful match to Comesana. Sure, go ahead. Walton won, Dar Dardary won. I'm going to get these names wrong eventually. Seb Corda lost, and that was the one I called as well. I said Seb Corda was in a trap part of the draw. Musetti won. Nishioka. Then Kenzie McDonald lost a thriller against Rusavori, which awesome match, by the way. Uh, Tistipas won. Fritz. We saw Rent. Rinderneck. Koboli. Tabilo won. I thought that might could be an upset. Jack Draper won. Also, could, I think, was called. Cam Norrie played a, a strong opening match against Diaz Acosta. Jeron, there's Zverev, and Herkaratz. They both won. Herkaratz scared the hell out of me after dropping the opening set to Albot, but I think he's in a very good situation now. He's won the last three sets and won. He'll play Felis. Uh, David Goffin lost a match at, to Matchock. Uh, Zafflin won. Uh, Agu Aliasime still can't make it past the first round. He lost to Kokonakis, who's actually very good friends with Nikirios. Pule won. Munar. Demonur. Runa. We kind of get the theme now. Chris Eubanks lost. That one hurt me a little bit. There's Kachinov, who, uh, Kar Karatsev, I totally said that right, uh, retired, so Kachinov won. Uh, Kachinov did look better after that. Very mad tiebreaker from Kachanov. Uh, he won that big time tiebreaker, and that's kind of led to the retirement. I believe it was to an injury for Karatsev. Achevery won uh, Paparin and Feeney, Fearnally, and Novak. So here's the second round for this. Um, in the second half of the draw, Komasana, Walton, Darty, Musetti. We see all of the matches here. Uh, I don't think we have any results in them yet. Yeah, the second round is going to be really fun. Over to the ladies' singles draw. And, by the way, none of the players I picked are out yet. Zero. Nada. Uh, on the men's side, at least. But on the women's side, we let's see how they did. Iga Zviatek won. Martic. Putinseva. Sinakova. Siniakova. I totally am nailing these. Caroline Garcia won her opening match. Called that one, too. Uh, Para won. Sinek. Sinegur, including a six in love second set. Brilliant job by, by her. Uh, Ostapenko won. Danielle Collins. Uh, Galfi beat Sheriff. Sure. Uh, Osorio beat Lauren Davis. I thought Lauren Davis could have won that, but her, that second set was so bad and she really didn't deserve it. Harad Maya won. Kreshkova uh, beat Kuder Matova. By, by the way, we'll get to the big upset of the round because the defending champ lost. Spoiler alert. Uh, Volonets, Busk, Buxa, uh, there it is. Vondrasova lost to Busas Maniero, 6-4, 6-2, sure. Uh, Rybakina won, she'll face Segamun. Uh, Wozniacki beat Parks, For Leia Fernandez won, Kalinskaya, who I, actually, I did not have for this. I did not pick Kalinskaya. Uh, Jabor, uh, we'll find out where Jabor is, but we hosted winners from Buk Buskova, uh, Annie's, uh, Avinason, sure. Samsonova, there's Anj Jabor. She'll face Montgomery. Nyamir, who will be playing Savitalina. Katie Bolte, who will be facing Dart. Wang over Tomova. Jess Pagula. Second round, uh, nothing's happened yet. So let's go to the second half of the draw. By the way, I believe it was a rain out today, so that's partially, so that's why we're here. Second half of the draw, uh, we had Zheng will fall. That was another one. Zhang losing the sun. That was a very interesting one. Starred... Oh, my God. 
I think I'm getting laughed at now by my chat. I, I like I'm dead serious. You tell me, chat, how you say this thing. Star o Dubetskova. Star o Dubetskova. If there's like a wow sound effect, I would have played it right there. A uh, Ju won. Pally, I think it doesn't even fully load on the screen, but she won as well. Emma Raducanu won as a wild card. She's actually made it through to the third round. We'll talk about that match in a minute. Meritans lost to Raducanu after beating Hebinho. Roos won. She then fell to Maria Sakari. Kataskina won, which, fair enough. Uh, but we're looking for certain players. We'll talk about them in a minute. Miyazaki, Badosa, Fruit, Fruit Vertova. Sure. Yastremska, uh, Gracheva, Vekic, Andreva, Paulini. We all knew that most of these were going to happen. Bianca, uh, I, uh, I know it's, I don't even know what it is. For Andrescu, um, Menin, Arani, Sam, Saram, Saram Kova. Sure. Wang, Maddie Keys, Sloan Stevens, Schneider. Uh, Naomi Osaka, who then lost to Emma Navarro. That match pissed me off. Because Naomi Osaka could have won that opening set, but then bottled it in the second to Navarro. So there's one player already out. Uh, was Naomi Osaka. I had too much faith in her. I knew I had too much faith in somebody here. But Burrell won. She would face uh, Kartal, Tadini, and Coco Goff. Second round in this. We had the aforementioned contest already. But let's bring them up again. Sun... And Zhu win. They'll face each other. Radu Kanu is facing the somehow not out Maria Sakari. Which, I, I got nothing against Maria Sakari. She's a good player. She's a high seed for a reason. She knows how to win titles. She knows how to do all this. It just sometimes in the majors, she's not been as solid. She's not been as on point. Kind of like a Felix Agu Aliasame type player. But she's made the third round. Sure. I don't have a problem with it. She'll face uh she'll be face a big uphill when she faces Emma Raducanu, which I should have picked as my other wild card pick for this. Kazinskaya, who has not played her match against Miyazaki, who's uh from Great Britain. But Osa hasn't played yet. That match hasn't happened yet. Stremska won. Vekic won again. Paulini and Andrescu, there's another upset. They'll face each other. Uh, none of the other matches are really happening yet. Sloan Stevens got ran off the court by Schneider, who faced the aforementioned Emma Navarro, and Coco Goff won her match today against Cartal. So there is all your Wimbledon action, and that is the end of today's episode. So yes, we will have a video go live today. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Shout out to Cam and Luke. Their links will be in the description. But for now, I'm Robbie Basil saying good night, and I will see you guys next video on Saturday. It won't be on Friday this week. It will be on Saturday. Goodbye, everyone.